That is Jim Huntinger. And Jim, he's uh, president of Lean Frontiers. And Lean Frontiers, they actually excel in doing conferences like this. You do summits in Lean Accounting, TWI, conferences or summits. And you have done that in the US for seven years. Lean Coaching, Lean HR, and actually some more summits also. Jim wrote an article back in 2006 about why standard work is not standard. And for me, this is one of the turning points for me to really get interested in TWI. So if you haven't read that article, I would recommend that you read it. It's really good. So, yeah. And actually, just Jim, he told me that he's also certified trainer trainers within industry. And it's actually two Pat, who are sitting in the back, our keynote speaker from yesterday, who also trained me in that. So he also has a very long track record of TWI. But for me, Jim is one of the big people within TWI, and I'm really looking forward to this story about the historic view of uh, TWI. So, yeah. So take good care of him, and welcome. Thank you, John. Um, good morning. Well, that's the extent of my Danish, so we'll go from there. So, but no, I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, it was a great, great day for me yesterday, just listening to the um, stories that were told. Um, great stories, great learning, and uh, we were lucky enough to go Sunday over to Lego and take a look at the museum and uh, also get a tour. So, I, you know, I love going in to see operations and all that, so that's certainly a highlight. So, uh, anyway, so it's up there. So. Basically, the title that looking forward by looking backward. Um, so I, I, I like history a lot, and I like history. My, my background, actually, and I'll talk about that a little bit, is a, is a manufacturing engineer and operations management, so that's my background. But I like history because I, I, I learn a lot from it. So that's what I'm going to kind of talk about now, go through some of the history and basically some of the stories, some of the learning um, that, you can take back, that you can take back from it. In a sense, that's what we're doing here. We're up here, so yesterday we listened to uh, Lego. We also listened to uh, um, oh, Novo Nordics. And essentially that's what we're doing. We're learning about their history. We're learning about their history, what they've done in the past, more recent past certainly, but what they've done. And what's that for? So we enhance our own learning. So we can figure out from the things that they did that worked well. Also figure out the things that they did um, that didn't work so well. So I bring up the first slide. I'll start off with this. So why the past? So this is, this is actually a, a pretty um, famous quote in the United States. I guess I don't know if in Europe you hear it much, but I've heard it for years, although I didn't really necessarily know where it originally came from. But uh, George Santayana wrote this. And it's those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So essentially what they're saying is if you don't learn from the past, if you don't learn from history, you're liable to make some of the same errors over and over again. So we'd like to not, not, not necessarily do that. We'd like to learn from our past. Again, one of the reasons being here, one of the reasons listening to the case studies, to learn from other people's past, to enhance our own learning, our own lessons, our own things that we're doing uh, in our own organizations. But I guess I like, I, I like a, a, there's a second part to this, not necessarily by him, but a second part to this I liked is, um, those who cannot remember the past are condemned not to repeat it when they should. So when you listen to Patrick and Scott yesterday talk about World War II, and I think there are some questions, and I think even during some of the lunch and so far, there's some questions was, well, why did TWI, um, why did we lose it in the United States? And there's certainly some speculation on that, some things we think probably caused that. But again, that's one of those things that drive me to that. There's some things we should be doing. It's one of the reasons we're at this conference, one of the reasons um, you folks are either doing or interested in learning about TWI. There are some things from the past we should be doing. So we're going to kind of walk through some of that um, today. So to give you a little background on me, when I came out of school, um, like I said, as an engineer, I went to work for a company called Ice and Seiki. And Ice and Seiki is a Toyota group company. And uh, so you could say, okay, the reason I took that job was it was to work for a Toyota group company. That had absolutely nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it at all. I took the position because it was a plant startup. Actually, the part of the plant I was responsible for wasn't even built yet. So I saw that, well, this has got to be a good opportunity coming out of school to go through a, a plant startup. And it was, it was automotive. They were, uh, um, if you haven't heard of them, um, they're Toyota's second biggest supplier. Probably the, the, their biggest supplier is probably Nippon Denso, or they're known today as Denso, if you've heard of them. Ison's their second biggest supplier, so an automotive supplier. 
So machining and assembly. I was interested in machining and assembly. That's what I was going to be doing with Eisen, plant startup. That's why I took the position. So I went through kind of the, the usual thing I got after being there for a few months. I got shipped over to Japan for several months to go through some learning there. Go to the different Eisen plants that were actually manufacturing the components we'd manufacture. Um, go to, uh, went to Toyota, went to visit Toyota because that's obviously who we're going to be supplying in the States. Um, Eisen was actually setting up this plant at that time to supply Toyota, who back, this is uh, 25 years ago, um, they had uh, the joint venture with General Motors in California, the NUMI plant. They had Toyota Canada, and then the Toyota plant in Kentucky was, was, was even, wasn't up to production yet. It was built, and they were doing some uh, mock runs, but they weren't even up to speed yet. So we'd be supplying, supplying into those. So to Toyota, we also went to some machine tool builders in Japan. They were supplying some of the machines that were going to be, that were going to be coming in. So essentially what we were going to do um, as the plant came up was, you know, I say, kind of pick up the baton. Pick up the baton from the Japanese engineers, go through ramp up, supply Toyota. So that's, that's why I took the position. And why in Japan, I, like I said, went to those, even got some TPS, some Toyota production system training. That was kind of interesting, but again, I didn't really have any context to it back then. Okay, that's nice. You know, what else? So I worked there for a couple years, but I had an interest. I had an interest. I wanted to get involved in the, in the process development as a manufacturing engineer. So it was a great, great opportunity at Eisen, great uh, learning from a ramp-up standpoint, um, but I wanted to get involved in the process. So I was there a few years, and I left to go to Briggs & Stratton. And Briggs & Stratton, if you're not familiar with them, they make small engines. Small air-cooled engines, mostly <laughs> single cylinder, for lawn and garden applications mostly, and some other applications. So that's where I went. The interesting thing about that was the second day after I joined Briggs and Stratton, the second day on my job there, it all of a sudden dawned on me that the rest of the industrial world doesn't work like this place that I just left, Eisen, Toyota. And oh, by the way, that's why Briggs & Stratton hired me, because I'm supposed to know something about this Toyota production system. It's like, oh my gosh. I'm supposed to know something about it. So that's 25 years ago, so I thought, gee, I, I, I probably should know something about this Toyota production system. You know, I had some exposure at Eisen. Um, so I need to learn more about it. And actually, here I am 25 years later, I'm still in that same mode. I need to learn more about this Toyota production system, or what, we'll, what we term the day now, you know, the lean, lean, lean production system. I'll call it the lean business model. But at that, that time, I was supposed to know something about it, and um, I'm not sure how, quite how much I really knew about it. So that's a little, little background for me. So kind of the agenda here. So like I said, we're going we're gonna to take, take a look back, backwards, to try to get some learning for what we can do today. Um, so the agenda, and I guess I call it an agenda in time. So we're going to look back 200 years. Um, we're going to look back uh, 160 years. And this is going to be related to, to TWI. Uh, 25 years, and that's kind of where, actually where I step into the picture. I'm not uh, really, really involved in the prior to, a little bit before my time. And 10 years back, and, um, and also, of course, currently, kind of maybe where we're at. What are, what are the kind of the, the, the current state of where we're at today? And uh, it's all going to be centered around some, somewhat learn by doing. So for those of you that uh, maybe are familiar with TWI or done some of the reading, that was a mantra from TWI, learn by doing, which is interesting enough. Before we knew about TWI, we all often heard that about Toyota, learn by doing. But actually, that's where it came from, was from TWI. So a little walk through, uh, through history and some learning. So again, like I said, learn by doing. So this, this is kind of um, try to put some context around learn by doing. And, and there's all kinds of things of, of what it means by learn by doing. So I'm up here. So experimentation. Uh, and we've talked about it. I mean, just even uh, in uh, um, case studies that we heard yesterday and with Patrick and Scott talked about, a lot of these things came up. Um, observation, uh, mentoring or coaching, leadership, culture. That's going to be a big part of this. That's what, what we're trying to do in a lot of these cases is we're trying to change our culture. That's certainly something that's happened from a, from a lean perspective. You know, we talked about the tools, and we have for quite a few years, actually several decades, particularly in the States. Um, but also in the last number of years, we've really learned, well, as important as the tools are, and they certainly are mechanically in, in the changes we need to make, it's really culture 
that we're trying to develop. So how do we go about doing that? Again, this is where TWI plays a role. And skills, skills was one of them. I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's what, you know, the, the, five, uh, the five needs of a supervisor with TWI, three of those are skills needs. So that's what we're talking about. Um, improvement, problem solving, essentially that's, that's gonna be somewhat, and I'll talk about that as well, somewhat of the narrative I'll go through today is problem solving. So we're gonna be all around about learn by doing, what does that mean? And again, putting a historical perspective on it. So again, like I said, it's essentially about solving problems. Um, just again, as the case studies yesterday, and I'm sure we'll hear it today, they're gonna to go through and talk about what are some things they did to solve their problems? What were the objectives they were trying to achieve? What were some of the st uh, strategic objectives they were trying to achieve? Or solving problems. But ultimately, a term that we commonly use, I guess in lean, is countermeasure. We actually don't want solutions, because if we're about continuous improvement, we really never have ultimate solutions, because things change. We learn more. Our business situation <laughs> change. Technology changes. So we're always, we're always needing to improve just by default. So what we like to use the term is countermeasures. We want to come up with countermeasures, things that help us with our particular problem at, at this moment in time based on the circumstances and the knowledge we have at this moment in time. But that's always changing. So therefore, we need to continually improve. So we're going to walk back through, like I said, 200 years ago. We're going to take a look at a five-step methodology that was a countermeasure to educating children. Uh, 100 years ago, at uh, the Ford Motor Company's Highland Park plant, um, the implementation of flow, as we think about with Lean today, and that was actually a countermeasure for trying to keep up with uh, demand. 60 years ago, um, teach, how many people uh, know who Toichi Ono is? So, some of you, not all of you. Toichi Ono is the, is the fellow at Toyota who gets the credit for developing the Toyota production system. But we're going to take a look at him, where TWI was a countermeasure for uh, Ono, who was uh, struggling for his people to accept flow. We'll talk about that in more detail. And 25 years ago, like I said, that's when I guess when I get involved. 25 years ago, I call TWI was my missing countermeasure. And I'll tell you about that. This missing counter countermeasure that, uh, that um, I was both aware of and unaware of at the time, we'll talk about that more. So the own, the, uh, my own flow implementation that I was doing with a group of engineers and managers um, in my background. And then 10 years ago, 10 years ago plus, where TWI was and still is, uh, the foundation to what we want to achieve, a high level sustainable improvement culture. In a way, that's, what we're, that's a lot of what we're talking about in the case studies. People are trying to develop this in organizations, develop this in their people, so they become problem solving. And it's essentially really a countermeasure. To the is a countermeasure to do that. And again, kind of where we're at current state, um, what I call trust in the process. And trusting in the process is a countermeasure, we'll talk about this more as, as we move along, a countermeasure kata to behavioral changes and cultural changes, which again is what we're trying to do with a lot of this in our organizations. We're trying to change the culture, a culture that's a, a continuous improvement, which ultimately means continually trying to solve problems. So, we'll go back 200 years ago, a couple centuries ago, to a fellow by the name of Johann Herbert. So it's interesting, Pat, Pat mentioned this, Pat and Scott mentioned this yesterday, that we think a lot of this stuff uh, in lean is Japanese, and we find out, well, it's not. A lot of it came from the United States. Actually, a good chunk of it came from the United States, although it was enhanced with some of the activities done over there, and Toyota particularly. But, Johann Herbert, he's actually German, so actually, we actually have our roots with what we're going through today actually in Germany 200 years ago. And Johann Herbert was a, was a philosopher and an educator. And what he did after, after his university education is he actually would contract himself to families to come in and educate their children. So that's how this all got started. So that's who he was. So what does that mean? Well, what he developed was this five-step methodology to educate children. So here's Herbert's five-step methodology to educate children. So first, prepare the, prepare the pupils to be ready for the new lesson. Does that sound familiar? I mean, I know, I know some of you are doing TWI, some of you are just getting into it, but just from what you heard, even what Pat went over, that sounds pretty familiar. Step two, present the new lesson. 
present the job. Sound familiar? Associate the new lesson with ideas studied earlier. Well, that's something certainly we're doing with TWI. That's part of the process. And use examples to illustrate the lesson's major points. Major steps, key points. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then ultimately test the pupil to ensure that they've learned the new lesson. That's what Patrick was going over yesterday. Okay, how does he like? Well, look at the story a little bit. So this is 200 years ago. Uh, Herbert developed this methodology for educating children. A little later in the 18th century, there's actually a group in Europe known as the European Herbations, folks that were using his methodology in education. There's also, um, there's also a group of what's known as the American Herbations who are using the same type of methodology um, in education and so forth. So it had transitioned from Europe, you know, a century after Herbert, into the United States, and there was a group of um, the American Herbations. Well, remember Pat talking yesterday, back in, uh, in the 19 teens in the United States, there was a fellow that was doing vocational training in shipbuilding in the United States, um, Charles Allen. He was one of the American Herbations. What, what, uh, what Allen did was he took Herbert's five-step method and converted it into a four-step method, which is what we're all familiar with today, job instructions. And actually, in 1919, um, Charles Allen wrote this book. It's over a 400-page book just on job instruction. So if you want to read details about what job instruction is, um, you can pick it. It's used. You can find it used. You know, I've read the book. It's an amazing book, and it goes into incredible detail about job instruction, the four-step method in, uh, I think, 400 pages, four or 500 pages. And this is essentially what uh, uh, Charles Allen did. And also, like I said, I won't go over too much of the World War II stuff. Pat and Scott did a good job of covering that yesterday, so in my history, I'm not going to go over that. But Charles Allen, the, the tie into World War II was, uh, uh, Patrick mentioned the four horsemen, the four guys that came out of industry in the United States during World War II to develop the TWI program. Well, three of those four, um, one of them had actually worked for Charles Allen directly during this time period, 1915, 1920, and two of them had been trained by Allen at that time. So they all knew each other and obviously knew uh, Charles Allen's four-step method. The other interesting thing, I'll touch on it, it is a little bit, when they, when they put together the TWI program during the war, the first year, they really struggled a bit because actually what they're using there was actually a, a consulting model to try to deploy this training in, in the context of what they talked about yesterday. And they soon discovered that there's no way under the sun we're going to be able to get to all these industries, all these businesses using this consulting method we, to, to make improvements. We need to come up with a different methodology. And what that ended up being was the four-step methodology that they learned in their past, and, and, and uh, they touched on it yesterday, and then using the multiplier effect. So you've heard of that. So that's, that's the tie-in. That's where this came from. So from educating children 200 years ago to educating uh, vocational training to in the United States to um, trying to drive up our manufacturing capabilities with, uh, with the influx of new people, as they talked about yesterday, to where we are at today. So this I found interesting. So this is actually a quote. So Charles de, de Garmo, who's actually one of the American Herbations, he wrote a book about it. So this book's over 100 years old. Uh, so obviously before, before Lean, before Toyota, actually even before the Ford Motor Company, we'll talk about them in a moment. So his book, uh, Herbert and the Herbations. But I found these couple quotes on it pretty interesting. So, the ultimate purpose of the Herbations may be said to be the development of character. Um, in a narrow um, subjective sense, not in a narrow subjective sense, but in a broad social one. So what are we trying to do with TWI? Essentially, we're trying to develop people, develop culture, develop character of people, or essentially change their behavior patterns through TWI and eventually change their, their thinking. You know, uh, um, we want to change them into this, not necessarily, but lean thinking type of. And he also goes on to say, the solution must plainly answer to the problem. Everything must be connected. Attention is, uh, is disturbed by alt, alt, uh, untimely pauses or introductions of foreign matter, because we don't like interruptions. But the key there is the solution must plainly answer to the problem. So we talked about doing TWI. What you, you're trying to 
one of the best ways to do it is you're trying to solve problems. You're trying to solve, you have business objectives that you're trying to use of this. The question always comes up, and I heard it yesterday, I think in here, I can't remember what time, I think in some of the discussions uh, we've had at lunch and so forth is, how do we get management on board? How do we get management on board? I mean, that's true for TWI, that's true for Lean. Um, but ultimately, it's trying to, uh, trying to put the solution in the context of the problems we have in our organization. So here this is, is this isn't, this isn't about manufacturing and things like that. These guys are writing from an educational standpoint, but it's still fundamentally the same thing. How do we develop people, people development? Um, what's, I can't remember the name, the gal from Lego that was up here from HR. Human resource development, that's what she's talking about. We want to develop our people, develop our people. And also, too, that our solution, although, again, I'll go back to countermeasure, our countermeasure must plainly answer to the problem. That's the whole point of doing a countermeasure is to help resolve, or at least resolve the problem at the moment in the context that we have. So, so that's, that's the tie-in. So TWI, you know, Pat said, you know, gosh, here we're using this thing that's 60, 60 years old now. What relevance does that have? Well, actually, we're not using something that's 60 years old. We're actually using something that's 200 years old. But it's still relevant. It's still relevant for what we're doing. So we'll, we'll jump forward a century. Uh, Jump forward a century to 100 years and also 60 years. So 100 years ago, um, actually, actually, literally 100 years ago, uh, truly, um, so this is 2013. In 1913, the Ford Motor Company um, built, built and opened up a new plant. It's known as the Highland Park plant. So have, has, has everybody heard of the Model T? How many people are familiar with the Model T? OK. The Model, T, the Model T was a car um, produced by the Ford Motor Company, which is actually truly one of the most successful cars in history. Um, at that time, 100 years ago, and in the United States, I think all, so the similar phenomenon in Europe, there was lots of automotive manufacturers. And only the very wealthy could buy cars um, because they were very expensive. But when Ford came out, and the Ford Motor Company too early on, made a lot of those cars that were expensive that very few people could afford. But Ford had this vision, Henry Ford had this vision, is he wanted to make the car for the masses. He wanted to make a car that anybody could afford, and that became the Model T. So in the original plant, um, they, they designed the Model T, but that original plant, which is actually still there, that plant's still in Detroit, um, uh, it's called the Paquette plant, but that thing certainly didn't have the capacity as they developed the Model T and then the demand they had for the Model T. So they built what was known as the Highland Park plant. And that was, a, that was you know, particularly in that time, that plant was a monstrosity for that time. But the whole problem, so the problem Ford was trying to solve, Henry Ford and his engineers and managers, was they could not keep up with demand. They were constantly, through the life of the Model T, until the very end, chasing demand. No matter how much they produced, they couldn't produce enough. So, that, so the model, the business model that they developed and applied was actually the flow model. One piece flow, one piece at a time. So actually one of the most successful lean plants historically is actually the Ford Highland Park plant. There's lots of lessons to learn from there. So they were chasing volume and doing that by trying to introduce one piece flow. And what that was doing for them, so if, I don't know, if you, may be, you may be familiar with the famous moving assembly line and there's pictures of that, black and white pictures out of the Highland Park plant. That was actually one of, the, one of the latter things they did from a flow perspective. They did a lot more work in fabrication and machining, trying to enhance flow before they moved it into the moving assembly line. But that's what it is. That was a manifestation on how do we, make, how do we get our raw material in and uh, turn it over as rapidly as possible. One, mainly for demand, to keep up the demand, but the other uh, advantage they got out of that is their cash flow. They had fantastic cash flow, not only because of volume sales, but they, they didn't sit on cash very long. Their turnaround, turnover of cash was very quick. So in the lean environment, that's one of the advantages of short lead times, turn around your cash flow, open up cash flow, reduce inventory. So that's what was going on at Ford 100 years ago. So we'll jump forward a, a, a little bit. So 60 years ago at Toyota, what I call it converging in history. So what, where was Toyota at um, 60 years ago or so? So if you don't know anything about Toyota, Toyota originally is a weaving loom company going back into the 1890s. Sikichi Toyota um, 
was uh, developed an automated le weaving loom and was very successful with it. And what's interesting thing about that, and this, this does tie into to what we're talking about here, is um, they're weaving loom companies. So Sikichi Toyota developed these uh, looms. They manufactured textiles from it. They uh, uh, were contracted to do that. They sold that. He also sold the patent. He did, had a patent for the weaving loom, sold that. He also sold weaving looms to other companies. But the interesting thing about Sakichi was he always took that money. He'd always run back to his workshop, and he'd go right back on to, he wanted to develop the, the next, next level of a weaving loom. So I guess that, he was very much a hands-on geek. I mean, he was a technical geek and just wanted to be in his workshop working on a weaving loom constantly. So another thing with Ford, so that's, you know, 1890s, 1910. Actually, interestingly enough, uh, right around the time uh, um, the, the, Toyota, the Toyota company that we really know today, because he went through several companies, really started right around the same time as Henry Ford. Very similar story. So his son, Keichiro Toyota, um, actually started the automotive company in the 1930s. So he started an automotive company in the 1930s. So um, it's interesting. So we look at Toyota. Toyota is this big global corporation, makes very good product, is very profitable today. Well, they weren't always like that. They actually made pretty bad products back then, and, and actually their cash flow and their financial situation was actually very perilous at times. Matter of fact, it got to the point so bad, um, they were getting pressure from the banks, that they actually had to lay off um, a number of their workers. And Kichiro T Toyota, and this is certainly a Japanese cultural thing, took it so much to heart, he resigned from the company, even though it was something beyond his control, he took responsibility for having to let these people go um, in order to, um, because the banks were forcing him to, um, in order to keep the company afloat. And actually, if you know the story about Toyota won't, does not lay people off today, it comes out of that very story of what uh, Kichiro did and out of that, they decide we will never put ourselves in a situation again where we have to do this with our people. But obviously they needed to, they needed to make money to be able to do that. So we move forward a little bit. So around 1940, 1950, um, there's a fellow by I mentioned before, uh, uh, Teichi Ono. So Teichi Ono started off working in, in, in the weaving loom facility, and he actually was a, was a good manager, good engineer, and coming into the 40s, he moved over to the automotive side. So again, the situation at Toyota at that time is they had low volume and high mix, and they were cash starved. So Ono was trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I turn this around? He was brought into their, into their machine shop, so he's a manager of the machine shop. How do I turn this around so we have cash, and how do I do that in a low volume mixed model? And one of the things that, that Kichiro Toyota had put out to the organization was uh, um, uh, we're nine times, Ford and the motor companies, Ford Motor Company still big then, Ford Motor Company was nine times more productive than what we are. We want to catch up with them. And oh, by the way, we're completely cash starved, so the only way we could do it is with our hands and with what's between, you know, between our ears and our head because we don't, certainly don't have the money to buy in technology to do it. We've got to figure this out on our own. So that's kind of somewhat of the task that uh, Ono had in the machine shop. So again, we look at Toyota today, lean, flow, all this wonderful stuff. Well, none of that existed back then. So Ono had this situation like the rest of us. So he was actually trying to take the Ford model, this model of flow, and implement it into his machine shop. And he had the same problems. Um, the people resisted. Uh, they were craftsmen. They considered themselves craftsmen. So they had no interest in putting things and running multiple processes. Um, they had no interest in that. And Ono tried all kinds of schemes to try to implement flow with this resistance. Um, one of them was he actually took his, his engineers and actually put those guys in, in as supervisors. Trying to think from a technical standpoint, they could help push the shop floor folks to, uh, to implement this flow model. Not much luck. Actually, um, Ono actually had a mustache, which wasn't too common back then. And one of the nicknames for him was Mr. Matt Mustache. Oh no, here comes Mr. Mustache. And that wasn't from an affectionate standpoint. So again, he struggled seven or eight years to implement flow. So his problem, his problem was flow, the problem was cash. So um, he was pretty much a hands-on. So, so uh, working through this, two narratives I guess I'm trying to do here. One is a narrative of flow, the other one is a narrative of problem solving. So we have Ono. So Ono, 
like Sekichi Toyota, and then also Keichiro Toyota. Keichiro Toyota was actually um, um, loved by his employees. And the reason they, they respected him so much, because they said he always stunk of cutting fluid. Because he said he couldn't walk through the shop without stopping by some machine that was having a problem and dive right into it. So they had a lot of respect for him, because he had a lot of respect for the, for the shop and spent his time out there and loved being out there. Ono was the same type of guy, very much a shop floor, hands-on, learn-by-doing guy. Matter of fact, he would say if, uh, if a uh, um, manager doesn't have to wash his, wash his hands multiple times during the day, he's not a good manager. So very much focused on the shop floor um, environment. So moving forward a little bit. So in the early 19, in the early 1950s, post World War II, during the occupation, again they talked about this yesterday. There's many things the United States deployed over to Japan to help them rebuild their industry. TWI happened to be one of those, and it came into Toyota through their training department, and Ono was, uh, like I said, he'd been struggling, very much like the rest of us, pretty unsuccessfully, because they tried to implement lean for seven or eight years. And when he, when he saw TWI come in and learned about it, he grabbed onto it. He saw this as a tool, I called it, it was the vehicle that he used to drive this type of thinking and behavior through the Toyota organization. First in his machine shop, then, then eventually on into their assembly process, and also eventually out in their supply base. So really, TWI was this leverage point, this countermeasure that he was able to do to implement flow. And I, I also said it, it also made sense to him. So again, if you look at, uh, historically, Sakichi Toyota, very hands-on, um, very shop floor, very machine orientated, and also his son, the same thing, and also Ono. So this just made sense to him. It made sense to him because it was very much a hands-on, learn-by-doing um, approach. And that's actually how that came into uh, Toyota. Kaizen, so Kaizen isn't a Japanese thing. Kaizen was a TWI thing. Kaizen just happened to be the word, the Japanese word they use for continuous incremental improvement. It made sense to them. And we'll talk about the little, little bit this more. So really TWI, I say, is really, I call it the scientific method applied. Or what we typically use, I guess, in lean environment is plan, do, check, act, the PDCA cycle, and problem solving. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Made sense to him. So, okay. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit here more for 25 years, to, you know, approximately 25 years ago. You know, I guess I step, it, step into the picture. I, I told you a little bit about, about my story. So I came into Briggs & Stratton. They hired me because supposedly I knew something about this Toyota production system, which I said was, uh, was you know, when I dawned on me, it was quite a shock to me. But what is the environment there? Well, the environment there is we were trying to implement flow. So we, Briggs is a very vertically integrated company. We did our own uh, uh, iron casting. We did our own die casting for aluminum. We did all our machining of uh, our components in assembly and engineering. And in this case, we were trying to change over the machine shop, which in this case is pretty massive. So one division in particular was very active in this. And they had five different <coughs> engine models, um, ranging from around 300,000 uh, per year annual volume to over a million, and the other, other engine models are in between that. And we machined all our own components, like I said, so crankshafts, cam gears, uh, cylinder blocks, small cylinder blocks, pistons, rods, sumps, you name it. We, we produced that all ourselves, machined all that at these high volumes. So that's the process we were going through, and we had traditional departments, a little illustration here, traditional departments, process oriented. So all our lathes were lined up, all our mills, all our drills were lined up. So we were trying to take all these departments of all these components of these five different engine models and put it into one piece flow. So that's what we were trying to do. And the other thing about that, with any of you that are, that are working on lean or have gone through that, you can't really go to your customers and say, you know, we got this great thing we're doing, this lean thing we're doing. We may miss some shipments because we're making all these physical changes. You can't do that. You got to maintain your shipments and all that. And we were going through that. And actually to this day, and this is, you know, 25 years ago, I've yet to see, we were <coughs> literally in our, in our plant, every day and absolutely every week, the plant had, was under, part of it was under a different configuration. For two years, we were moving things on a daily, weekly basis going through this process to transfer all these old departments into these new departments. Um, 
th uh, through that process. And we actually call them focus factories. So this is, this is uh, how many people have heard, uh, know of the book Lean Thinking? So remember you, Lean Thinking, so it was a book that really you know, came out that really drove a lot of this. Well, this is before Lean Thinking and the term value stream. Value, the term value stream didn't exist. So that's why we used, we just used cell, flow, we called them focus factories, what we call value stream today. So that's the process we're going through. So for me as a manufacturing engineer, an operation, this is a, we were having a field day. Talk about learn by doing. Boy, we were, we were learning by fire going through this process and trying to maintain our output and all that. So like I said, the, so the learning and implementation was going at a rampant pace. Literally on a weekly basis, the shop floor was changing. And we were doing projects, we were doing Kaizen events like we use today. Um, uh, actually, I, went, I actually went to, and me and some of the other engineers I work with, the managers, we went to some of the original Kaizen events that were done at the Danaher Corporation by the Shinji Jitsu Group, um, you know, 25 years ago. Um, we went through some of those, and we brought that back to, uh, to do that in our own operation. We had the Shinji Jitsu Group come into our plant. We actually did our own internal Kaizen workshops. We went through that process. Like I said, set up focus factories. So we were very much learned by doing. I'm um, going through that process. The struggle was back then, where'd you, where'd you go for resources on this? There wasn't really much things as conferences on this subject, let alone TWI. There wasn't really that many books out there. The internet, the internet existed at that time. We had one, we had one computer over in our corporate office that had access to the internet, so essentially we had no access to the internet. So there wasn't really, wasn't really any information to go get too much to really learn about this. We were just stumbling and bumbling through this as best we could. Certainly a, a learn by doing. So here's, some, here's, a, here's, a, here's, a, here's a story behind some of that learning that went on. Um, learn by doing. When I worked for Eisen, I would get this a lot. And if you, if you, if you talk to people um, that work for Toyota, you hear similar type of stories. They would say, uh, a gym son, I needed to do, go do something. I was, we actually had lines, we had some CNC machines. So I was, we were doing some programming, some other things on the CNC machines during that ramp up. Gym son, please go try by yourselves. And all I had was this CNC manual <coughs> that was mostly in Japanese with a little bit of Jinglish. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I can't even read most of this. And what I can read doesn't make any sense the way it's written. Oh, please go try by yourselves. Well, I guess there's more than one of me. There's only self. But go so I'd go out to the line, and I would uh, try to work through this, try to you know, run parts, and try to learn the line by myself. Not, not really, not really the, the training, learning, like we see with TWI, but certainly go learn by doing. So fast forward a little bit. When I was going through this process, another interesting thing about this, we had machine tools that were from the 1930s and 1940s. So this, is, this was in the 1990s. So we had machine tools that old. We also were bringing in state-of-the-art CNC equipment. So going into these one-piece flow lines, we had uh, machine tools built prior to World War II. We also had brand new machine tools in these, in these uh, cells that we were putting together. So. Um, <coughs> One of the setup men, there's one the setup men I worked with was uh, named Larry. And I had Larry working on these CNC machines because some they never worked on these CNC equipment before. They were very good at the machines we had, very knowledgeable, very good workers. I'd say, give me, give me an army of Larry's setup people like that, and I'll, I'll compete against anybody. He was a great guy, a great uh, setup guy. So I had Larry trying to learn um, the CNC lathe we were using. And Larry comes up to me one day, white as a ghost. And he says, um, Jim, I need your help. Yeah, sure, what is it? Well, can you come with me? I, I just want to show you. Yeah, sure, no problem. <coughs> so I go with Larry. We go out, to the, go out to the line. This is for crankshaft machining. And uh, the lathe door shut. And I go, what is it? He goes, well, look. So I you know, go in. I, I look through the window of the lathe and, uh, and just start laughing. What Larry had done, he had crashed the machine. So he'd rammed the turret up into the part and uh, had, uh, had broke, broke the insert and broke the tool holder. But I just laugh and I go, Larry, no problem, don't worry about it. Until you can crash the machine at the level I have in my past, you're still an amateur, don't worry about it. Because when I said, go learn by doing when I go out the line, when I talked about work you know, with that Jinglish manual, I said, I've, I've milled off multiple times, three quarters of a fixture. So breaking a tool, <laughs> that's nothing. So, so 
keep at it, don't worry about it, no problem. And that's one of the things from learn by doing from a Toyota standpoint. So when I did that, you know, I called in the Japanese engineer I worked with because I was, I, was I was pretty frustrated and mad. I don't, I don't have the it's tools or the information I need to do this. So there you go. I just crashed the machine, machined off three quarters of the fixture. So he walks out there with me, looks, and goes, oh, Jimson, maybe no good. Yeah, you're telling me. I don't need you. That's not much of analysis. I could figure that much out. Just said, no worries. You know, please, please look into getting new fixture parts at a local vendor. So there wasn't any, you know, you know, you idiot or admonishment about it. It was just, I hope you learn from that. Let's resolve the problem, get new fixture parts, and keep going. So the same thing with, with Larry. No worries. Again, until you become a professional machine crasher like me, don't worry about it. So Larry went on. Luckily, Larry did much better than I did. That was the only time Larry really had any problems where I, did, I had multiple crashes. So Larry did much better than I. But that's also the environment. So another thing about this was Briggs and Stratton had, we had a union in there. And from a management union standpoint, we, it was very, it wasn't good. There was all kinds of animosity between the union and, um, and the, the management. But even though we were going through this process, the operators, the shop floor, the hourly the union people were excellent. I literally broke union rules on a daily basis. And I never, never had a grievance. I never, didn't even think about it. It's because we were so focused on how do we solve these problems? How do we move from these traditional departments into this flow cell and, uh, and get things ramped up, maintaining our output production, but getting these things up and running? So that's the environment. So zooming in a little bit more, it's not real clear. So what we were focused on was again, one piece flow. So our, our vision was one piece flow, and that really drove everything we did, even though it was something fairly simple, very simple in concept, but more difficult to implement. So the way we looked at machines, um, machine uh, fixtures, uh, flow of the line, standard work, material flow, line layout, the whole plant layout was all driven by this vision of one piece flow. How do we do that? How do we do one piece flow? So that's what drove us. And actually overall, and again, looking back 25 years, I mean, I've been in Europe, I've been in Japan, I've been in the United States, seeing One Piece Flow, we did a lot of very significant changes with One Piece Flow. We also had a lot more work to do because we also had a lot of problems. For every problem we resolved, we easily uncovered about three or four more. So it was a struggle. So that's a, that's a narrative flow. So where does TWI come into this? Well, for me, it came into this. As, as we developed standard work, in this process, um, we, had a, we, had a very, we had a struggling time. We could never get our operators, operator day to day, shift to shift, hour to hour, to consistently output what our tack time told us we need to output. So we very inconsistent. Remember, they talked about yesterday about creating this foundation, creating this stability. We didn't have that. We struggled with it. And I wish I had this end of this story that. We discovered TWI and life was wonderful if we did it. But we never did. I never did. But I knew, I knew there had to be some, I worked for a Toyota group company. I knew they were human like the rest of us. So I knew there had to be something, this is the thing, there was something they had to be utilizing that in the United States, we just, United States, we just didn't know about yet. So we never resolved that, at least I didn't at this point in time. So we'll jump forward a little bit, 10, 10 years, 10 years plus a little bit uh, later. So TWI, so that's why a number of years later, so this is a number of years after that, when I, uh, when I ran across um, TWI, and real quickly, what I, the way I ran across that, in 1997, so this was in the early 90s, my story from Briggs, 1997, um, two books were published. One was called Gimba Kaizen by Miyasaki Imai, and I think somebody, somebody had it, I think I saw it in a slide, somebody referenced that yesterday. And also the book Becoming Lean by Jeff Liker. So it's Jeff Liker's first book, um, Toyota Way, Toyota Talent, was referenced yesterday, but Becoming Lean, which was a collection of uh, chapters written by other people. Well, there's a chapter in Becoming Lean called, written by John Shook, who's an American who was also hired by Toyota. He's actually the president of Lean Enterprise Institute today. So he was hired by Toyota. So when I read it, John's chapter, he has this one sentence in there that mentions training within industries. And I read it, I thought, well, what does some World War II program got to do with the Toyota production system? Oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay. Well, the very next book I read, because they were published at the same time, was Gimba Kaizen. In that book, there's a chapter 
that, uh, that discusses training within industries. And I went, I've got to find out what, what some World War II program has to do with the Toyota production system. So that got me going on the research. I, I wanted to find, find out what uh, TWI had to do with that. And what was interesting, when I, through the, through the course, there's more of a story, when I finally got the information, it was about a year-long process for me to dig, go into the Milwaukee Public Library in Wisconsin, digging through their archives, trying to find this information. So when I finally did find it, and finally got it, and uh, I got the, the 1945 report that was written at the end of the war, and then eventually that told me how to get the manuals. So when I eventually got one of the original manuals, I started reading through this thing, and I was, just, I was completely shocked. But what I realized, that this thing from years before, that I knew had to exist, but I had no idea what it was, but this was it. This TWI thing was this, this was this missing piece, like I said, I called it earlier, this missing countermeasure that, that we needed in order to train our employees, in order to have really day-to-day -day Kaizen, uh, as we call it today, in place. This was it, this is a secret, and, and we need, I need to learn more about this. So what does TWI create? And again, Pat and uh, Scott alluded to this yesterday, had a little bit. It creates this environment, this environment. So what it is, so the stair steps. So if we look in the past from our, from our lean implementation, the ones that do that, we tend to have this improvement trajectory that kind of goes up. We certainly make improvements, but it usually flattens out and even kind of degrades a little bit. And that's one of the problems we have, is we just can't maintain. Relative to Toyota, where they're on this improvement trajectory that is just a much steeper end, and they continue on it. I mean, for decades they have. So how do we achieve that? And, this, and the key behind that was TWI. So, and again, Pat mentioned this. So um, you could take job methods, the improvement, you make the improvement, job, rela or job instructions, you stabilize and standardize. Make that so you maintain that. Make the improvement, stabilize and standardize. Continue to improve it, constantly improving. I mean, that's what we're trying to do with TWI today. Some of the stories, like I said from yesterday, well, I'm sure we're hearing today, is about this, about this same thing. How do we create this environment? And from this standpoint, JR. JR kind of creates this, this environment where this, can, uh, where this can thrive. You know, you hear sometimes a lean environment, no blame environment. Well, that actually came out of JR. To create this environment, how do you resolve people problems so they can focus on these other two and create this continuous improvement, this continuous improvement day in, day out. It becomes embedded into the culture, into the behavior, into the thinking. This is the very thing that Ono had picked up on. I could use that, like I said, he'd struggled like the rest of us out in the shop. I can use that to create this environment for improvement. In his case, trying to implement the flow model. So I put this up, and this, I know this, this is charts a bit of an eyesore, but uh, I think what it shows, and this is related to the scientific method. So TWI is, is the scientific method. So if you look, the scientific method is laid out here, but we, use, we tend to use the scientific method in, I guess, the lean community as a plan, do, check, act, PDCA cycle. So as you see, in a PDA cycle, is simply the scientific method. I like to say TWI is simply the scientific method applied you know, in a very regimented, systematic manner. That's what you're doing, these, the fourth step. And that goes back, like I mentioned, Charles Allen, who took Johann Herbert's original five steps, changed it over to the to four steps, and actually it's really the, um, uh, you, know, prepare, you know, preparation, present the learner, associate new lessons. With, that, that part's actually kind of been moved external. So that's still part of it. That's still part of what they went through. But all this is, if you look across here, for the plan, do, check, act, and for the scientific method, that's what it is. It's just a very, very specific way to use a scientific method for problem solving. That's it. That's what we're trying to do with TWI. We're trying to solve problems. So where are we today? Go through that. So back to this slide. So learn by doing. So what are we doing? So I, like I said, I try to go through this historical narrative that that this whole learn by doing has, has kind of gone on for a long time. It's impacted, it, it's impacted industry, um, very much similar um, in the things, issues, same issues we had. You know, as great as Toyota is today, really looking at them more when they struggled is actually a little bit, uh, maybe a better lesson. So they were very much similar to the rest of us. Had problems, struggled, needed to use uh, some systematic tools, an important one, what became foundational for them. 
to even to this day was uh, um, TWI. They still use it today, and but learn by doing. So one thing I like to say about this um, is learn by doing. So how many how many of you heard of the five whys? How many people have heard of the five whys? Most of you. So problem solving. Well. Through my career, I learned I don't really like calling it the five whys. I really like calling it the 500 whys. Because in most cases, I had to ask why a lot more times than five times to really come up with a root cause. And through many things, like I said, when I talked about my own history, my own background, going through a lot of those things that we did at my days in Briggs & Stratton, oh my gosh, 500 whys. We just went through that over and over again. Like I said, we didn't, we didn't have any really companies to go to. We didn't, there wasn't really much literature. There certainly weren't really conferences that we could go to and learn from other people. So we had to struggle and, like I said, stumble and bumble through our, through our uh, just on what we had there. Um, very much like it. So one of my favorites in this is try. That's what I got at Ison. Jim Son, please go try. And that's what we did when I was at Briggs. We, we didn't have an alternative. We'd have to go try, run the experiment, try. So what I, I'll call it again, try again. And a lot of times I'll say 500 times. So not just the five try agains, but the 500 try agains. Try over and over and over again. And again, just listen to case studies um, here, and I'll hear, I'm sure we'll hear it more today, is um, going through this process of implementation, even with the resources we have today, um, other companies, books, you know, great books that are on this, it's still getting in there and doing it yourselves, the learn by doing, trying over and over again, expecting to make errors. Somebody brought that up yesterday. You should expect to make mistakes. So this, if you're, if you're, um, if you're not making errors, or certainly you don't want to be catastrophic, but if you're not making errors, you're pro probably not learning at the level you should be learning. So it's okay to make errors. We want to make errors. We want to run the experiment, plan, do, check, act. That whole cycle, plan, do, check, act, is really about um, learning from those and learn by questioning. So questioning. So I've had a few conversations with people about coaching. Coaching, and if you look particularly in a lean environment, and, uh, um, and if you talk with people from Toyota, they'll tell them, and I actually Pat, I don't know, Pat may be able to relate to this, is their mentors never, never answered any, que any, any questions they'd have. Their response to most of their questions was with another question. So they wanted to go think for themselves. And if for any of you that have heard the stories about uh, Toichi Ono, the famous Ono circle, he would draw a circle on the floor. And actually, again, I know some guys that work for Toyota, you know, uh, in, in the U.S. Said, they'd say, go out, go out and observe the, the, the process. Go to Gimba. So we talk about going to Gimba. Go observe the process. So Ono would draw a circle on the floor, tell his guys, stand there all day long. I know a couple guys, they'd say, they'd stand there all day long. They'd have no freaking clue of what they're supposed to be looking at. And what they tell them the next day, did you learn anything? I don't know, I guess. Please go stand out there again. And it was very frustrating, like my own experience with, with the Jinglish manual. It was very frustrating, but, but eventually I learned. I didn't learn as rapidly as Larry. Larry was a better learner than I was, because um, I crashed the machines a lot more than he did. But just go learn. Go by learning and trying. Go by learning and, and uh, observing. Go to the Gimba and ask questions. So the, questions, so the questioning part of it is very important. And not just from coaching other people, but even from yourself. Always ask questions. If you're going through the, the, the PDA cycle, part of that is questioning. What did I learn? What did I learn that I could use again? What did I learn that didn't work? What did I learn that I should maybe reevaluate re my, my, um, my hypothesis and go out and try it again? So going through that cycle, so that's things we want to do in our organization is go through that cycle, that questioning cycle, reflecting. So if you look at that, one of the things on there is uh, reflect, reflect. That's a big part of, of lean. What is reflect? Reflect is really stop and thinking, stop and questioning yourself on what you've done, what you've accomplished. So I want to go through this. So um, in going through this, how many, have, have any of you read or heard of the book Toyota Kata? So some of you, well, it's a good book. I, I certainly recommend it. It, 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 adds, it added a clarity for me um, in this. And there's a diagram um, that uh, Mike Rother is the public, uh, author of this, put in there, this diagram. And this diagram very, very much resonated with me. Because what this diagram says is you have a current condition. And if any of you have done value stream mapping, that's what it is. What is our current condition, current state? 
And then you have this target condition, where a target condition is a different than a target. A target condition is more abstract. It's not completely abstract, but it's not completely defined. We don't want it completely defined because it makes our direction too narrow. In the case, uh, I think I in the case of my, my past, our target condition, although we didn't have this terminology, I didn't know about this diagram back then, our, our target condition was one piece flow, which like I said, drove everything we did. But the problem is, is in order to get from the current condition to the target condition, you gotta traverse this unclear territory. And that's, that's what we're doing. And this unclear territory consists of going through the PDA cycle over and over and over again. So if you that's why that's why it's jagged. That's why your path through this is kind of jagged. So you're going through these PDA cycles over and over again to figure it out. And that's why you don't necessarily have specific targets. So traditionally in project management, we know we have current condition, that's pretty easy, and we have these targets. And we have this clear path and certain milestones and things we want to hit. I'm not saying those are necessarily all bad, but if you make that too focused, you'll hit them. But the thing is, is if you go through it in this manner, this learning process, you'll hit target conditions at a much higher level. So that's one advantage. So that's good. You want to hit these target conditions. But something that's more important, this is what's more important to Toyota, is the learning process you go through in this unclear territory. At the time, I was going through all that at Briggs. It was great. I mean, I loved it. It was great for being a manufacturing engineer. But it wasn't until years later, through reflection, I went, oh my gosh, the learning I went through that time period, although it was horribly frustrating at times, although obviously we didn't, weren't successful in everything we did, but the learning process was pretty tremendous. So I call this trust in the process. So in organiza organizations today, okay, so this kata, so this kata. So if you go through the improvement kata, in the book they talk about the improvement kata, and improvement kata, actually in our case here, is J-I, J-M, and J-R. Those are a type of improvement kata. And what kata is, is, is a practice, practicing something in order to make the, the behavior almost automatic, habitual. And that's what we're trying to do with TWI. So if you go through the, the in this case, J -M -J, uh, J -I -J -M and JR process, you'll get to where you need to be. So a lot of times when you're doing the job breakdowns, when you're doing all that stuff, you don't necessarily know what the process is going to look like once you start going through JI or JR or the job breakdown in particular. But going through the process will guide you, will, will open up the facts, the details, the observation to you on where you should be. And although it may not be permanent because we know that um, Situations change, so periodically we need to update what we're training people to. Technology changes, new people come in, um, we make improvements. JM, we make improvements, it changes. <clears throat> but you'll need to get to where you get to. You certainly get to somewhere that's better than where you were before. That's certainly an objective you're trying to reach. And the more times you do it, and this is key, the more times you do it, the better you get at it. So that relates back to this um, diagram again. So when we start off, and again, because this question always comes up, how do we get management on board? Well, why can't we get management on the board? Because those guys are scared. This is very, uh, this is very scary for them. It even maybe very scary for some of you when you first go through this. Because even once you get the training, which is true, when you get the initial training from JI, that's just the beginning. You're just starting out, even though you've got the training. The real task comes from, and that's what you get taught, is go out and start doing job breakdowns. Learn the method. Learn the process. Go out and start teaching people this until you actually do it, which is why even in the 10-hour classes, why they actually have you do it, because you need to do it in order to, to learn it. So when you start out, it can be a pretty scary process. People, organizations don't like being in this unclear territory because it's unclear and because your target condition is, can be somewhat abstract. So. So I, got the, I put this quote. This is a new book that came out just this year by Art Byrne. And uh, again, I mentioned some of you have read the book Lean Thinking. So one of the case studies in the book Lean Thinking is the wire mold case study. And the wire mold company is probably, probably one of the best success stories of Lean in the United States. And Art Byrne was the CEO. He was hired in of the president CEO of uh, wire mold and took that organization through a transformation process. So this is, what, this is what Art said. One of the biggest challenges most CEOs 
executive management, even ourselves, I'll face is that lean requires a leap of faith. What well, leap of faith is traversing through the unclear territory. Um, this is a little scary. It's like he said, this is scary um, for both both of us. In this case, he, George was talking, or um, Art was talking about himself, and he because he was like a divisional manager of a uh, of Danaher, Corp uh, Danaher Corporation, and his operations manager was a guy by the name of George Koenigsegger, who today is one of the more experienced lean uh, CEOs out there as well. So this was scary for both of us because they were constantly asking us to do things that we really questioned, that didn't make sense to them. On the other hand, and this is what I think is important, on the other hand, we wanted to learn. So that's key. We wanted to learn. Um, everything we did was in the leap of faith category because, again, they, you know, admittedly, he says at the time we thought they were nuts, but we did it anyway. And boy, did it create chaos in their shop. But because, uh, and the reason it was a leap of faith was because the but what if it doesn't work? Again, again, that's a lot of, the, in a way, in different forms, feedback I hear from people is that's why management's scared. Well, what if it doesn't work? What do we do then? So that question's always in the background. So organizations, a lot of times, not always, you don't necessarily all of this, this situation, but are always a little bit scared, a little bit nervous. So where do you want to move to? So you want to start getting in there. So you want to start learn by doing practicing with TWI. A little bit uncomfortable because you're unsure. You don't have much experience, but that's why you're doing it. You uh, um, are a little bit uncomfortable. People in your organization, and again, I hear that coming. There's people in your organization as you go through this process are a little bit uncomfortable as you take them through this. But where you want to get people through is you go through this, so they start getting comfortable. And what that comes about by, well, gosh, actually we are having success. Actually, we have started reducing our time it takes to get people up to speed. Actually, we do have fewer problems because we started utilizing this. Actually, we have reduced some of our inventory and our lead times, improved our cash flow. Well, that isn't too bad. So people start to get a little more comfortable when you start having results like that. But you need to show them. And then you want to get to the point where people want to be in here. And again, I hear some of that in just some of what people talked about yesterday. Uh, a couple weeks back, we had the TWI summit. So as you hear people tell case studies, they get to the point where they want to be here because they know the success that they can have. And even the people, some of the people that are skeptical at first get to the point where they want to be in here because they see the success. They see the result. They, they get comfortable with the process and they get confident in the process that they'll get the results they need. And ultimately where we want to get people to is we want them to thrive in this unclear territory. We want them to thrive in there. So again, back to, you know, all the way back to the 200 years, we we're trying to change our culture to this continuous improvement, problem-solving culture where we utilize the tools, not for the sake of the tools, but for the fake sake that we understand how to use the tools, how we got to change. When we heard each of those stories just yesterday, we'll hear them today, everybody did it a little bit different. Because there's certainly a common thing in lean world is, well, what should I do? People want, tell me steps one, two, three, so I can go do it. Well, the answer is, well, it depends. Because everybody is unique. But the principles, the, the processes and practices we use have a lot of similarities. So you apply them and you get comfortable with them. So you thrive in this. Trust in the process. Um, one example I'll give real quick here, because the book was mentioned yesterday. So the book Toyota Talent was mentioned in there. So one of the co-authors of that was uh, David Meyer. And David Meyer told me this story once. He said he, got, he worked at Toyota, so he had this background. He had been trained in TWI and all that. But he said he came in for a consulting thing for a supermarket organization. So they went to Gimba, which in that case was, the, was a supermarket. So he's walking around by the guy that brought him in, and they're taking a look at that, and they're wanting to implement lean in a grocery store. So David's asking him questions. And eventually the guy stops from the questions David's asking. He turns and looks at him. He said, well, you really don't know anything about the the grocery store business, do you? And they go, well, no, I'm, you know, I'm a manufacturing guy. No. And the guy goes, well, why would I want to hire you then? So David's response was, well, ultimately that's up to you. But he said, I'm not going to tell you what the solutions are, countermeasures. But what I am going to do is teach you the process so you could resolve your own problems. Because that's the key. Me solving them for you isn't going to do you much good. But you learning how to solve the problem, learning the, learning the process, the trust in the process, that's what's really I'm trying to do. I'll learn a little bit in the process too, but that's really why I'm here. That's you know, your decision to hire me, but that's, he said, 
If you're hiring me to solve the problem for you, don't hire me. If you're, if you're hiring me to help you um, understand and learn the process so you and your people can solve it, I think I can help you. So um, real quick here. So again, another, another quote from Mark Byrne. Um, the good news here is that for the most part, once a person has been in a real lean environment for any length of time and has had the proper exposure, he can't make the transition back to a traditional organization. It just won't make sense to him any longer. Again, that's what we want to get people. We want them to thrive in that environment. We want them to want them to be in there because everything will seem backwards and inefficient. And some of you that have gone through this, um, I know I, lo, lo Lego. I'm assuming at Lego, you would never right now consider, let's go back to the way we used to train or not train people at all. Because that'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? You won't go back to it. It makes sense. So you want to get your organization to thrive in this. You want to get them so they, they know the process. That's what teaching the TWI is. They know the process inside and out. And it becomes very natural for them. So again, you change that behavior and change the thinking. And uh, I think it's the last slide. So I, I like to say this a lot of times. So C TWI, back historically, is what developed what we call standard work in Kaizen at Toyota. It came from TWI. That's what it is, that process. I like to say, you will not become lean by doing TWI. Doing TWI in and of itself is not going to make you a lean organization because there's so many other dynamics with it. But you will not become lean without doing TWI. And that's because it's such a foundational skill set to have in your organization to utilize. It's such a foundational process to learn in order to make you this improving, daily improving culture and environment um, with your organizations. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing the case studies today. I, I, you know, I always learn from them. I, and I love to hear, back in my own background, I didn't get a chance to implement TWI, because I didn't know about it, back in my, in my organization. So I, we, we made a lot of progress. We made some fantastic progress, but I knew we could have made a lot more, but didn't get the opportunity. So I love hearing about what other people are doing with, with it and how they're being successful. So that's that for me. Thank you very much. And, uh, and actually, just a quick plug, we're, there's gonna be, we're gonna have a European TWI and Workforce Development Summit in Prague later this year. So I, I'd like to see, I'm mean, working on the United States, I'd love to see more activity in Europe as well for organizations from a TWI standpoint. So I'm excited about this conference and for it to keep going here in Denmark in particular, but you know, just keep at it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim.